Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So it's a great pleasure for me to introduce Wanwo Lee. He's from the Ubiquitous Virtual Reality Lab at the Gwangju Institute of Science and Technology in Gwangju, Korea. Uh, he will be talking about his work in mobile ro augmented reality. Wanwu received his bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from Hanyang University in Seoul, and then uh, in, in uh, his master's degree in information and communication from, from GIST. And he's uh, currently about to get his PhD uh, at GIST uh, on, on this topic, and he's here visiting as a gratis visitor for three days, yesterday, today, and tomorrow, uh, along with his advisor, Professor Woon Tak Woo, um, who is a consulting researcher here for uh, this week and next week. So if you like what you're hearing today and want to talk with either of them, let's say this afternoon or tomorrow afternoon or some other time, um, please see me um, in person right after this talk, or you can send me an email Phil Chow um, to set up a meeting time with them. Uh, so um, one whose current interests are in um, silhouette segmentation for 3D reconstruction, real-time object detection for augmented reality, and GP GPUs for high-performance computing. And we'll let him talk about his work in mobile augmented reality. Thanks. Thank you, Phil. <coughs> uh, good afternoon. Uh, I think it you'll be a little bit uh, sleepy after your lunch, but please focus my uh, presentation. So today I'm going to talk about video-based institute tagging for mobile augmented reality, which I have worked on during my uh, PhD studies. So the outline of this talk is, as shown in this slide, I, I first show some research overview why what I have done, and I give you some introduction about augmented reality, and then I go through some details of my work, and I conclude the presentation with the future work. So one of my uh, researches, which is ongoing, is uh, textualist object detection using depth information. So Using uh, depth information, we can do many things, as you know. So providing depth information can help us detect some complex 3D object, which does not have much uh, textures. So we use uh, RGBD. We combine the RGB and depth information for uh, target detection, and then estimate the each pose using 3D shape of uh, target object. This video shows some detection results by overlaying the name of the target object on top of, the, uh, on top of them. And this part shows the advantages of using depth information. Uh, when we use RGB image only, by it really uh, affected by uh, lighting conditions. In this case, it's sunlight. But we combine both information with depths. Uh, we can do some robust detection. And also, lighting condition problem happens when there are uh, severe shadows uh, on the object, like this. So we can do the same thing by combining RGB and depth information. So this is my, uh, one of my ongoing research. And, uh, this is a little bit apart from the topic today I present. And the interesting thing is, using depth information, we can know the size of the target object. And then, even though there are uh, two objects which has the same textures but have different uh, scales, using depth information, we can identify uh, each uh, one from the other. So this is an uh, interesting part of using depth information. OK. Um, so during my PhD course, um, I focused on some computer vision techniques that 
uh, is for reconstruction of 3D object, and then the reconstructed 3D contents are uh, augmented, are uh, used for augmenting real scenes by virtual, uh, but by augmented reality applications. So basically, I assume that the users takes photos, their mobile phones, and then they, we have collected uh, the photos from users, and then we can reconstruct from 3D objects using the photos, and then 3D model, and, and it's, from its texture, we can create the realistic 3D content. And then the realistic 3D content is uh, overlaid or merged in the real scene through sort of augmented reality techniques, and then we will get the, uh, some kind of uh, more realistic peeling from the uh, AR application. So from this viewpoint, uh, the systems uh, works like this. <coughs> the user captures photos from mobile phones, and then the photos are transmitted to the uh, modeling server. And in the modeling server, we have to do some uh, 3D reconstruction. But before that, we have to identify the target object from the a set of photos, which is taken from multiple viewpoints. So we first do uh, multiple shielded segmentation. And here we using some uh, color and spatial consistency measured in 3D and to identify the foreground object from the images. So this video shows how the uh, work, how the method works. So here there are uh, photos taken from multiple viewpoints. And then <coughs> we first initialize the, the silhouette of target object by intersecting viewing volumes of each cameras. And then And then we iteratively optimize the target object silhouette in all the view sets simultaneously. And after doing some iterations, we can see that the foreground object is uh, uh, regions are uh, more uh, refined. And then finally, we get the silhouettes of the uh, foreground mm -hmm. object. So here, OK. Then after finding a silhouette of target object, we build a 3D object from silhouette and color images. So next part in the end is uh, 3D reconstruction. And here I worked on building a smooth visual hull, of visual hull from silhouettes and color images. So <coughs> in this case, we have images and uh, silhouettes and then we reconstruct visual hull. And, but the visual hull is quite simple reconstruction method. But the, uh, we aim to build a smooth surfaces uh, by intersecting a silhouette to use it in, in, uh, in, in augmented reality applications. So we iteratively define the 3D model to get a smooth meshes and by, we have to do some textures. Then we have a, a 3D model of the uh, one object in the photo. And then those 3D reconstruction is transmitted to, again, mobile user's mobile phone again. And then it's uh, then, uh, used for uh, augmenting real scenes through uh, mobile phones. So this demo shows how we do it. Um, you just take a shot from a target object, and then we do some automatic learning on mobile phones. And then the target is instantly detectable from uh, video sequences taken from mobile phone's camera. So I pick a 3D model, so we construct a 3D model from the uh, handphones, and then, and then you can see that uh, the reconstructed 3D model is then 
uh, overweight in the real sense with a proper uh, six degree of freedom pose. So uh, this was my uh, research introduction. And then I will, today I will talk about the, the, part, the, the rest part of my work I showed uh, previous slide. So the, uh, yeah. So before I get into details, I first mentioned about the concept of ubiquitous virtual reality, which is, which aims for virtual reality everywhere. So in ubiquitous virtual reality concept, the real and virtual world is merged in augmented reality space where uh, the real entities are mirrored to virtual entities. So the connection of the real and virtual entities are important in this concept to making an interaction between the virtual and real world. So to connect the real and virtual entities, we have to uh, recognize the 3D objects or anyway target objects from uh, image sequences. And my work is about that. Uh, this figure shows uh, a, one some kind of a vision of mobile augmented reality, which can be regarded as a subset of a UVR concept. In this figure, the real objects are uh, <coughs> connected to uh, virtual entities. Usually, we call uh, AR annotations. So, so the virtual information is overlaid to the uh, real scenes through uh, camera, and then the virtual entities is uh, geometrically registered with the virtual uh, real objects. But the problem arises when we do uh, these things in outdoor scenes where the scene is unprepared. Unprepared scene means we have uh, not much information about the scene. I mean, in like a 3D geometry of the scenes. So in this case, uh, even if we want to do some annotations on a specific object, we have no uh, way to do it usually using uh, computer vision techniques. So because we don't know the target object at that moment. So we need some kind of uh, online learning and detection of target objects in situ to make a user uh, to be, uh, be able to interact with the target object without uh, prior knowledge. So we propose uh, an, an augmentation method with uh, minimalist user interaction, which is very simple point and shoot approach. This video shows the over, overview of my method. When you just take a shot with a mobile phone camera, as you see that the target object is, can be detected from uh, without uh, any difficult interaction. And then users can add a virtual augmentation on target objects. So the advantage of this method is it is very simple, and it doesn't do any uh, complex 3D reconstruction of the scene. And also, the users can detect target object from a different viewpoint, although the input is not um, as many from the cameras. So, um, yeah, here. So, my method have some assumptions. So, the, the input to the algorithm is image of the target object. Usually, I assume here that the target object is planar. And the output is the 
patch data and its associated camera poses to uh, retrieve is the six degree of freedom pose. And the assumption here, uh, we have known camera parameters like a focal length and principal points. And also the, we assume, I assume that the target object is either horizontal or vertical, which, is, which are very common in the real world. So from these assumptions, um, target learning procedure learns in, as shown in this slide. From the input image, I first the compute a frontal parallel view, which is the normal viewpoint, which is the image of a target object taken from normal viewpoint. I will explain that uh, in detail later. And the target object is uh, learned from is is learned from the uh, frontal parallel view by warping the input patches and you applying some blurrings. And I do some post processing. So the frontal parallel view generation step is warping the source image to a frontal parallel view. And the template learning step is for uh, building a template data from the input images. So the first, the first step of learning the target is the frontal parallel view generation. And you, some of you may wonder uh, what the frontal parallel view means. So the frontal parallel view is uh, figures like this. So it is taken from the normal viewpoint. The, the object and the camera has no uh, orientation, orientation changes. So usually in computer vision-based object detection methods, it's a frontal parallel view is required to learn the planar surfaces. So the situation is the user's camera is at the same height of the target object. However, in real world, this is not uh, always happen. So this situation is more common. The target object is lower than the user's viewpoint or higher than user's viewpoint. In this case, the images acquired by a camera is have a perspective distortion because of the camera's characteristics. So not always the frontal views are available in the real, in practical situation. Especially for horizontal surfaces, you, you will not get the, you, will, you, you may not don't, you, you may not want to get a picture of an object from this viewpoint. We just usually see from, uh, have, a, have some angles relative to the target object. So from these photos, uh, it is not possible to uh, retrieve the correct template data, which can apply for uh, detection and pose estimation. So the, the objective of frontal parallel view generation is warping the source image to make it uh, uh, seen from frontal view. So the approach here is exploiting mobile phones built-in sensors, especially the accelerometer, which provides the direction of gravity. So we combine adding some uh, computer vision techniques and phone sensors, and we do this very uh, easily and fast. So let me talk about a little bit more about accelerometer sensor. It provides the direction of gravity in, in points local coordinates, and the gravity is normal to horizontal surfaces and parallel to the vertical surfaces. Then, so uh, the direction of gravity 
provides very uh, strong, uh, good information about the horizontal and vertical surfaces, which I want to interact with. So uh, let me talk about first uh, the horizontal surface cases. In horizontal surface case, we can assume that there is only uh, one degree of freedom relative in, in the orientation relative to uh, orientation between the camera and the target surface. Well, usually this not, uh, usually uh, generally it is not, uh, it does not have, uh, it has more than uh, one degree of freedom, but I made an assumption that there is only pitch rotation. So from the known camera metrics, we can set the frontal view camera, which is virtual, for to uh, identity pose. And let me define the, the capture the camera has some rotation and translation. We can compute the rotation from the accelerometer value directly. And then its translational parameter can also be computed from the rotation and some distance, which was predefined as a focal length. And from the known rotation and translation parameters, we can uh, compute the homotopy that warped the input image to the uh, frontal parallel view. And the, the H is the homotopy here. So doing that by simply from the input image, we can rectify the image that by the, to make the result uh, have a right uh, frontal parallel view, as shown <coughs> in this slide. So you can see that uh, well, it's, it, the rectification is quite good, even though we, do, we don't do any image processing here. So horizontal case is very simple, but how about the vertical surfaces? Okay, we, we can uh, make an also make an assumption of one degree of freedom rotation to vertical surfaces, like uh, the images shown in, in the top. But in general, more complex cases are happening in real world, as shown in this here. So users have some more orient orientation, deep, make some orientations using his hand. And also, the vertical surfaces can have uh, orientation relative to the user. So what about these cases? So we, the sensors cannot solve this problem. So now we add some uh, computer vision techniques to make this problem easier. So in vertical surface cases, our approach is using the vanishing point, which is very uh, straightforward, to find the orientation of a vertical surface relative to the camera. So here, the accelerometer, again, uh, helps the vanishing point estimation. So by estimating the vanishing point from line segments, the orientation is retrieved from them, and then the rectification is done by the same as we do in the horizontal surface case. <coughs> so um, let me explain how the accelerometer can help this procedure. So here, the vanishing points in vertical direction can be uh, expressed as the projection of a point at infinity to the camera. And then the, uh, the, the projection procedure is multiplying just uh, camera's intrinsic parameters and uh, extrinsic parameters. And then the 
applying the rotation and translation to the, the original uh, point at infinity is uh, giving us the point at infinity in the camera coordinate system. And this is the, this uh, coordinate, so the point at infinity that is in camera coordinate system is the same as the gravity direction measured by the point accelerometer. Because the, the vertical direction is the same and its direction is measured by point accelerometer in its local coordinate system. So, by just projecting the gravity uh, values to camera's coordinate system gives us a rough estimation of a vanishing point in vertical directions. So this is uh, this this helps uh, estimating the vertical vanishing point because this estim uh, this rough estimation is quite good actually. So to from line segments, we have some line segments in the image, and then we also have the low estimation of a vertical vanishing point by projecting the accelerometer values to the camera. And then using that uh, low estimation, we have to do some refinement with the uh, Lansac uh, optimization approaches. We find, uh, identify some vertical lines using a distance function from the vertical vanishing point because every vertical line should pass the vanishing point in, in image, image coordinate system. And we do some refinement iteratively and then we will get a good estimation of a vertical vanishing point here. Another vanishing point I have to find is the vanishing point in horizontal direction. The horizontal direction in the vanishing point in horizontal direction can be found from using the vanishing point we previously estimated in vertical. There is uh, <coughs> some uh, orthogonality constraint between vanishing points here, like in this equation shows that, and we made us some uh, and hypothesis using this orthogonality constraint and then do line clustering using uh, Chaka distance which is defined as, as something like this but I will not explain this in detail. You can refer the reference here. And then do some line clustering and merging the cluster sets and do some uh, iterative estimation, we will get the horizontal vanishing point from the uh, best cluster. So now I get the uh, two vanishing points from two vanishing points in horizontal and vertical and then from this the orientation of the surface, planar surface can be retrieved and this is not that much uh, difficult part. So the advantage of using accelerometer here is the speed and robustness. In case of the speed, if we do the uh, vanishing point estimation in conventional way, which is just most of them are used to some line clusterings, it takes so much time on mobile phones, but the mobile, you know that mobile phones has still have uh, less computational power compared to the PCs, so it, is very, it becomes very slow on mobile phones. However, using a uh, benching point, as I explained, we can directly estimate the <coughs> vertical benching point uh, in uh, quite good accuracy, so it makes the problem easier. So as you can see this uh, figure, it, using the uh, accelerometer, the, the speed of Vanishing point estimation becomes very fast. And the other is robustness. When there is a very complex uh, 
when the, the a scene is very complex, some uh, vanishing point estimation using line clustering sometimes pays because there are not much uh, horizontal or vertical lines sometimes. So, however, again, we know where the vertical vanishing point is with a good accuracy so that uh, we can find the vanishing point even in very complex cases. And in this, in this case, uh, there are not many uh, horizontal and vertical lines, but we still can do the job very well using the accelerometer. Okay, until now I explained how we get the frontal parallel view of the target object using uh, accelerometer sensors. And then now we are ready to uh, acquire some template data from the target for detection. So next part is template-based learning using uh, blood patches. Mm. So the objective of this uh, template-based learning is uh, to acquire some data the, from the textures of the, uh, the frontal parallel view we made it in previous step. And we, here we adopt the approach of patch learning which was proposed in 2009 in CBPR, which is uh, for a past patch learning by linearizing a uh, warping procedure. And it uses a mean patches as a patch descriptor. However, this, the problem with this method when we're applying this to a mobile phone is uh, the memory requirements of the method. The original method requires uh, about the 90 megabytes here uh, to load pre-computed data for fast learning. And uh, the performance also uh, problem on mobile phone CPU at the time. So instead of using uh, min patch itself, we try to mimic the, the original algorithm by applying some blurring method. So how to compute uh, min patch is from the input patch, the input patch is warped uh, from uh, several different viewpoints and these patches are average it and then it gives a mean patch. But our method is just apply some blurring to original uh, patches and then get the similar uh, resulting patches and I call it a blurred patch. So how, how, let's see how we do it. So applying this uh, Applying the, some uh, set of blurs to the image requires some time on mobile phone CPU. So we try to exploit mobile phone's GPU for make it faster. So our blood patch is computed through a multi pass rendering scheme shown in this figure. Let me explain the step, each step in detail. So the first step is from the input patch, which is warped to frontal parallel view. We warp the input patch to some another viewpoint to make a detection in varying uh, viewpoints. And this uh, warping is replaced by uh, rendering in a frame buffer on GPU because it is much faster than the warping uh, on CPU. And then the loading part uh, come here. So in the third pass, uh, the Gaussian, ah, no, in the second pass, we apply radial blurring to the warped patch 
and this radial blurring allowed the blood patch covers a range of poses close to the exact pose, which means uh, the original uh, mean patch algorithm does several warp to the several times to warping several times and then average it, but we skip the uh, the warping procedure and we replace it to uh, radial blurring. Then we apply a Gaussian blur to make the blood blood patch uh, robust to image noises. And then in the post pass we accumulate uh, blood patches in a texture unit. And the reason why is it reading uh, a set of blood patches from GPU is it, it, it reduces the number of readback and the number of times required for copying data from GPU to CPU. And finally, we do some post processing like down sampling and normalization. And, and we finally get a set of blood patches and it's associated a uh, six degree pr of freedom pose. And then now we are ready to detect the target object. So from until now, uh, we have some data and we want to detect the target object from uh, incoming video streams of mobile phone camera. And again, uh, we use the gravity information for template matching here. <coughs> um, the problem of th the, the Template detection method is very good for object detection, regardless of the textures and shapes. However, the thing is, the if we use more templates, we can uh, detect the target object, target object from a large uh, different large set of different uh, viewpoints. But if we use more templates, it makes uh, the detection slower because we have to compare more and more templates with the input image sequences. So, so if we have too many templates, the performance on smart mobile phones becomes very bad. So to, uh, to address this uh, problem, we again use, we use again the gravity information. And uh, uh, yeah, so let me explain how the gravity works here. So we assume that the real world objects are aligned with gravity from gravity direction. For example, like this, the, the horizontal and vertical surfaces I mentioned, you know that there, there are, the gravity direction is e either normal or parallel to those surfaces. And for the 3D object, we can assume that the upright direction of the object is usually parallel to the gravity direction. So, so here I introduced the, the term gravity aligned image, um, which is uh, where the vertical vanishing point is either 0, 1, 0 or 0, minus 1, 0. It, it means that it is a, it, it up and or down direction. So this means that uh, to make the upright direction of the target object in image uh, parallel to the gravity shown here. So let me show let me explain the more about this. So the, in, the, in the original image, which is taken from uh, a normal viewpoint, is the gravity and alumni direction is parallel here. And then when a user makes uh, some orientation changes in, on the phone camera, the captured, in the captured image, the, the target object's alumni direction is no more 
parallel to the gravity direction. And then the gravity aligned image means we warp the capture the image to make it this uh, online direction parallel to the uh, original gravity directions. And how? So the advantage of uh, uh, this uh, gravity aligned image in template detection is we can reduce the number of orientations to consider when building templates, which means uh, as shown in this figure, using a single template to detect the target objects. Okay, we, we, we just build a single template to uh, detect the object in different orientations like this. If we do not use a gravity aligned image, we have to build a template in all these cases and it increases the number of templates here. So the, uh, okay, the, let me explain how the gravity aligned image is computed. It's quite easy that, let's assume that the, the image is captured by a camera there and this is the gravity and uh, what we want to do is making the blue and Red, red arrows parallel like this. And this is, can be done by simple uh, rotation transformation. And if we know the angle theta r and the transformation can be easily computed. The problem is how do we know the angle theta r here? And the thing is the blue line is the line connecting the vertical benching point and the center of the image. So from this fact, if we know the vertical benching point, we can easily compute the angle theta and we can warp the original image to the gravity aligned image. But as I mentioned, the conventional benching point estimation methods are very slow. In case, especially in this case, we have to do template matching in real time. So uh, even though the benching point estimation takes a few uh, hundred milliseconds, it, it is very slow in template matching process. So our, our approach is using accelerometer 2 here, and then I explained that the accelerometer can give us good estimation of uh, vertical vanishing point reversal. So R theta can be directly obtained without any image processing because we know the, bench, the, look, the position of vanishing point from accelerometer directly and applying this rotational transformation is very simple. And we also do it on mobile phone GPU for a faster warping process. So uh, this video shows, gives you a very clear idea about how the gravity aligned image works. You can see that the ori in original algorithm, the target object's upright direction changes as the user rotates the camera, but in, in gravity aligned image, you can see that it keeps upright direction always here. And another video gives you more, more clear uh, idea about this. You can see that here, it, it, it's always kept in um, its own right direction in, in the warped image. Yeah. And after using template matching for target detection, we do some tracking uh, using uh, ESM blur algorithm, which will be uh, 
introduced by uh, my another colleague who will come next week. And then, so we retrieved a six degree of freedom pose from the detected target of the detected uh, target surface. And here we use some uh, uh, neon instructions, which is like a, a SIMD instruction, like a SSE in on Intel CPU. It is the uh, mobile CPUs. So I explained uh, all the theories about my work, and I'll give you some experimental results. There are very uh, some parameters here. And here, the our method is requires the data of target object is just uh, 900 kilo, about 900 kilobytes, and which is very few for uh, target detection relative to the uh, original algorithm. Yes. So you take a picture of that many views. How do you know which object to learn? Ah. Do you, do you actually does the user have to no, say? No, here the uh, these these uh, two hundred uh, two hundred and twenty five views are generated from the input front of parallel actually, view. Synthesized. Yeah. So this video shows how to work with horizontal target. It's similar to what you see at the start of this uh, seminar. Learning reference template just takes a few seconds here. Then user can start uh, detection of target object by selecting not selecting. So the target object pose is uh, augmented on the target object. And again, user can select a 3D object, which is related to uh, the, the content of the box, and then render a virtual object. And this one is interacting with the vertical surfaces. Again, user takes a, a photo of a, a vertical surface from arbitrary viewpoints. And then it is rectified using benching point. And then it's a, template data is generated on mobile phones at the moment. Then users can start the detection and uh, from different viewpoints here. This one shows another experimental result detecting detection in different uh, viewpoints for vertical and horizontal targets. And this one is for different scales. Because we build the templates considering a uh, scale, we can detect the target object in, in different scales. And this one shows the targets whose frontal views are unavailable, usually a vertical, uh, vertical surfaces on a building. And this one is a horizontal surfaces, which is very far from a user. And definitely, the, its frontal parallel view is not available to user in this situation. And by estimating six degree of freedom pose, the virtual content is overlaid with the right orientation. What did you say about scales, how to learn the scale? Ah, the scale is the distance from the target object and the camera. Yeah. The input image is just, uh, just a single scale. Then we warp the input image to uh, different distances. So, I mean, you, don't, you can't recover this. 
you don't really know what this, given an input image, you don't really know what. You yeah, really the, know the, the, the real distance is not known. So this is a, the relative distance. Okay, but then if you want to put a sign on a building of a, you know, to match the size of the doors, let's say. Yeah, the, the, the size of virtual contents should be uh, controlled. It is, uh, should be known in prior, or the user have to give some input to determine the scale of virtual contents. <laughs> okay, so once you've labeled, once you've annotated the, the, the sign of the right size on the door, mm -hmm. and somebody comes up later mm -hmm. and looks at the same door, maybe from a much different distance, will they see the sign it would be the right scale? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Because the, uh, it just, uh, the method of rendering what size of, what size of the, the rectangle. Yeah, you mean in, in the sign case? Yeah, or that, the, the, the um, person who is standing on the ground. Yeah. I mean, obviously, he was very big uh -huh. in some sense, but yeah. if you wanted to... Ah, uh, you, you mean the, uh, yeah. this case? Yeah. Okay, if, if, we, if I see this region, like, uh, okay, this is uh, uh, the loop of the building, and if I see this, this region, maybe uh, like uh, second stories, we'll becomes very big because because the scale is uh, maintained between two uh, applications and then this is uh, the 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 target in a building which is very much higher than users uh, viewpoint so what is uh Sometimes I get confused about which one you use to learn, which one you use to actually have the building or the building. Yeah. Yeah. We have three pictures. Right? Yeah. So the uh, which I mean the left. So the, the from your side. Yeah. The leftmost image is the input image cap captured by a user. Okay. And then the other two is just showing the detection results in this slide. So it's been trained by some other image. Remember the learn, learned, the target has been learned on some other images also. Is that right? No, that, that, that the left most image used as an input and then the templates are built from that image. And then these, these are just uh, another screenshot of detection. Okay, these are different images of the first one. So yeah, they look similar, but different. Correct for the most like rotating on the camera, right? That's that's not very common. Though. Why would they hold my cell phone like that? Uh, yeah, but uh, it happens. I like it. We usually we use <coughs> phone, phone uh, mobile phone like this, and then do not see content like this. But when you use a mobile AR application, uh, there is always some orientation changes because you just want to see the contents in different directions and it makes some orientation changes on the phone. It, well, it depends on. Yeah, I, I still, I will have to ask you how you would do the match. So like, I assume that the middle image is a test image. Yeah. I'm trying to you know, offer the user takes picture of the same <coughs> image, and then the system is going to detect, trying to detect the, uh, yeah. the picture. Um, to do the detection, of course, there's no prior knowledge of where the picture, the picture is. Yeah, right. So, so would you have to like, scan, scan everywhere? Yeah, we, our approach is uh, doing some kind of a scanning approaches. Yeah, there's a two, two, two possibilities using some corner detection to uh, make a, let, let me say, the, 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 in the target object, there's a corner. But you don't do corner detection, right? 
you will detect tender mesh? We uh, tried uh, corner detection and both also scanning approaches. And then in case of corner detection, it's uh, affected by the textures. You know, if the corner is not detected, the template is uh, not comparable to the region, even though the object is there. And so we adopted the scanning approach. Okay. So, so if you're really scanning, you uh, how do you know the, or the window size to scan? Yeah, it is uh, predetermined. I mean, oh, okay. yeah, it, there is a predetermined window size when we like a sliding window, we moves uh, the patches the window to <coughs> something yeah, I, like I know, this. I know the sliding so you say that the size of the window is pretty self-determined? Yeah, I mean, <coughs> you the, the, the patchy learn this, uh, the, the rectangle at the center of the first image. And only the, 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 that, that part is used for running, not we don't use the entire image. I understand, I understand. But uh, because uh, suppose the, uh, you know, you do the learning image on the left, mm -hmm. suppose the patch size, the image size of that, 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 that picture, suppose it's 50 by 50. Mm -hmm. But on the, on the image in the middle, that same, that same picture, the size of maybe could have been 100 by 100 pixels. You mean that the, in, in, in the input image, I mean, not for, for used for detection. Yeah. In in that image, the target can be smaller yeah, or larger. Smaller, right? Yeah. So that we uh, build uh, some templates by applying some scale factors there when we warping the images, when we synthesizing the images used for template building. Yeah. I'll ask you later. So so the thing is, the in, if the input image is here, yeah. I no. The target object is here, and when you user cap, if the front of parallel view camera is here, if we the pose, we, if we move the camera to the front, now the the image the object becomes larger, mm -hmm. and then we build templates from the the enlarged the image, and it uh, give us uh, templates uh, of, of this situation. The templates cover sort of different sizes, yeah. but the, but when you when you scan your window, right, each window you, the window may only cover a portion of that image. Yeah, right. So then, the, in, so then even though your template already has different scales, but it does not help in this case. Yeah, in that case, uh, too much scale difference makes a problem in detection. Okay, I give some more examples. You captured the real world, I can attach some spider man to these words. So what you can do, this method is uh, instant 3D augmentation, which was uh, similar to the previous video. And this one, add some, this one is interacting with uh, the ceiling. And another video is just interacting with this shaded region. I made this video for fun. <coughs> Can pick this up. And here comes uh, an X wing here. Okay, then another is, uh, this video shows the sharing augmentations between two mobile phones, right? In here, the, mobile, the target is acquired by phone A, and it is transmitted to the phone <coughs> B through Bluetooth connection. Then, then phone B starts the detection of target object, seeing the, the virtual messages on the target. It was very hard to control two mobile phones in one hand <laughs> at the time. So 
So we do some Bluetooth connection. So make a connection and it's uh, easily transmitted to mobile phone B. I give you some results about the uh, performance and timing. This work, it was uh, the timing was measured on PC and iPhone platforms. So this is shows that the graph of learning speed, how much time each step takes. So it the time increases as the number of views we consider increases because we have more warping and blurring for more more viewpoints and uh, on a pc it's just very fast uh, just a few hundred milliseconds and on iphone or iphone 4 it takes several a few a few seconds but the too many viewpoints make it slower. And here the, the most con time consuming step is the radial blur step, which is uh, it is slow because it, it, it accesses the textures in, on, in GPU in uh, random or not random, but it, it's, it accesses not not horizontally or not vertically. So, in in mobile phone GPU case, those kind of access is very slow, so that the radial blur takes much time. And uh, but it can be it can be implemented faster if we optimize my shader code. Yeah. Well, you do you do the the rotation. Radio yeah. And then you subsample the image to get the image. Yeah, we do that. Did you try doing the other way around, like subsample first and then How much worse? Um, the thing is, uh, what we wanted to know is the 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 the, the gray, let me say, gray value over pixel at the same position which is in, in the original patches. If we subsample the first image and then we blur in radial, the, the blurred pixels are different in that case. Yeah, so that, that's uh, what I didn't want to do it. So, so I didn't try it yet. Okay, and this slide shows uh, the comparison with the original algorithm in detection performance. And you can see that ours is a little bit, uh, has a lower performance, but it still uh, comparably shows uh, good detection performance. But except that these rest uh, three cases, these, are, these images are very um, repetitive, have repetitive textures like a, a grass or make mini board or another some board of electrical devices. There are so many similar textures. So if I applying blurring to that, it shows a poor performance. And you can see that also the original algorithm shows a little bit lower detection performance. And this is a comparison in, in memory usage. So the as I told you, the original algorithm requires large amount of pre-computed data, but we don't want to do that. So we reduce it to, to be take another approach and you can see our 
the memory consumption is much less than the original one. So we lose some detection performance, but we can have large amount of memory saved here. So let me conclude my uh, presentation here. So the, we propose some computer vision-based approaches for in situ AR tagging in real-world environments. And we exploit the sensor information, which is very popular on modern smart, smartphones for doing computer vision works. And then finding, for finding orientations or finishing points and template matchings. So using our approaches, users can do some in situ interaction with the real world by learning and detection the target object. So what I explained uh, until now was about interaction with real and virtual for uh, personally, but Augmented reality is in, in, in not, okay, let me say, in ubiquitous virtual reality, it is not limited to the uh, personal interaction. So the users, two users can interact with uh, using augmented reality applications by connecting, by sharing their environment in build by building augmented reality uh, spaces in their own locations. So AR will be can be used for uh, interaction between users as well as to uh, virtual and real worlds. So this is the my future work concept of mine. So, Kate, this is what I prepared for this presentation. Thank you for listening my work. Thank you. We grill them a lot. I have one more question. Regarding the scenario where the in situ learning, yes. uh, it seems like the scenario is that you take a picture and then you annotate it, and then you're going to recognize the same picture again. Yeah. Right. So it doesn't seem to be very useful. Why? Since you already you just take a picture, why would you want to, to recognize the same picture in the same place again? Well, this is about the uh, okay. For personally, it is not that much meaningful because yeah, I don't want to see it again. But considering some kind of a social applications. What if I make an annotation about an object, let me say a picture in the museum, I, I can make some annotation about the, uh, my, my impression about the picture. Can the others maybe who visit the museum first time may want to know how the other feels about these pictures. And then it can be seen by their mobile phone. So this is not for just uh, personal usage. The, the application is for sharing the, these augmentations among the other people, with other peoples, like, like we, we do Twitters on smartphones. Yes? Um, the accumulation step, I just want a clarification on that. What exactly was that? I, it, it looked like, I mean, so I, when you say accumulation, it sounds like you're doing, you're computing like a mean image or something, but the graphic you have looked like uh, you're doing yes. a, a texture the, atlas or the, something. The, the, term, the term accumulation is a, a chem a little bit, it is a little bit misreading. So my, my, my intention was that uh, just putting the result in uh, textures, like, okay, let me say, packing it. So, so it's a texture apples. Yeah. Right. Okay. Question? 
question? Let's thank the speaker again. Thank you very much.